Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on using DDA basic system design confirmation presented by Keith Caggiano. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Director of Marketing at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Keith Caggiano, the presenter for today's webinar. Keith has spent his career focusing on the design and implementation of large-scale sound systems for both live performances and permanent installations. Prior to his current role as business development manager for Install Performance Systems, he served as the product manager for the JBL and Televox series. Now I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Keith. Thank you, Laura. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, hopefully, some of you uh, attended the uh, webinar that we had last week, I believe, with Stefan Lewis, which was an overview of what JBL DDA is. Uh, so today, we're going to build on that. Um, we're going to build a basic model. Um, this assumes that you have, you know, a basic uh, venue in mind. Uh, you know the dimensions of that room, uh, and you just want to test out a, a design concept that you have, uh, whether that's, in this case, I'm going to be using a combination of Intellivox products and some CBT products. Um, the nice thing about DDA is it can use any products that have CLF data. So this could be something from really any product out there that has that available. Um, today we're going to focus on Intellivox and CBT, as I mentioned. Uh, I'm going to start by using SketchUp. Uh, we have a plugin for SketchUp, so you can build your model in SketchUp. Uh, and then export it directly into DDA. So I'm going to start with that process. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in SketchUp. There is a lot of good training uh, material on their site, uh, so you can get, uh, you know, proficient uh, in using their, uh, their resources. Um, so we're going to do a basic build in SketchUp, and then we're going to move on, import that into DDA. And, uh, and look through some of the feature sets in DDA and how I get to this model that you see here in the, uh, in the picture. Uh, all the software, uh, the DDA software and the plugin for SketchUp is available on the JBL site. Uh, you see the link above for specifically for DDA. Uh, feel free to try to follow along if you have this already loaded on your machine. Um, and otherwise, uh, please enjoy, let's get started. Okay, so to start with, uh, like I said, I'm going to build a, a very basic model here in SketchUp. And the purpose of this is just to show how easy it is to get uh, something into DDA to start working. Uh, you can just start open in, in DDA and it'll give you a very basic box shape room and you can just establish uh, an audience area and, uh, and calculate coverage. If you're just using Intellivox, that might be sufficient. Uh, but most times you do need to get a little bit more specific uh, as to the dimensions of a specific room. So this is one way that's quite easy to do that. Uh, so I'm going to begin, as you see on the right here, I have some basic dimensions of the space. Uh, I'll work through this and then I've got the model already built, so I'll jump over to DDA and I'll show you the import process. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to jump, jump to my plan view and I'm going to start laying out some markers to indicate the dimensions, overall dimensions of the room uh, and then build from there. Uh, so I'm going to use my ruler tool and I'm going to create uh, the, the width of the room uh, based on my uh, x-axis being the center line. Uh, as you can see over here, the room that I'm working on is going to be 60 foot wide by 90 foot deep. So I'm going to go 30 foot in this dimension, zoom out to where that actually makes sense size-wise. I'm going to do the same thing in the opposite direction, 30 foot in the opposite direction. And I'm going to go and I'm going to give my room depth. So I'm now going to go 90 foot. And I'm just typing in these dimensions as I go along. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, working on specifically what I'm doing in SketchUp. Uh, it's really just to give a quick overview of how this is done. So I'm switching over to my box 
square geometry tool here. So there's my main floor plan for the room. Uh, next thing that you can see here is that this room has a rise of six feet starting 10 foot from the stage. So I'm going to put an ind indication of where that begins by snapping from my Y axis 10 feet into the room. And I'm going to draw a line there. And there's going to be the beginning of the rise of the room. Uh, the next information I have is that it's going to, that rise is going to end six feet from the back wall, whether that's a cross aisle or whatever happens to be back there. So I'm going to do another, draw another line towards the back of the room. I'm now going to rotate my model and I'm going to use the move tool to grab my rear plane here. First, I'm going to grab the whole plane and I'm going to raise this up six feet on the blue axis. So now I've got a very basic audience plane uh, and my six foot rise front to back. Uh, so I'm now going to step to the, uh, uh, the aisle sections that I have indicated here. Again, I'm going to go to my ruler tool. I'm going to snap some guides. So I've got a six foot center aisle. So I'll snap to the center and then I'll indicate three feet from either side of that. The only reason I'm doing it this way is by using the ruler tool, uh, referencing the side of the plane. It keeps the ruler oriented along the surface of the plane so that I get my audience laid out exactly where I want it. Um, so there's my center aisle. I'll now go to my pencil tool and I'll draw that in using the snap. And I'm going to indica indicate my side aisles. Three foot in from that side, three foot in from that side. And snapping front to back, front to back. Move over to my select tool. You now can see I have a one audience plane on that side, another one on this side. Uh, these planes don't indicate anything really until I get into DDA, at which point I'll be able to uh, specify these as a, as a listener plane, uh, set the height that I want to make my measurements relative to these areas, uh, and, and uh, continue modeling from there. Uh, so that completes my main floor area. I'm now going to switch to my stage. So I'm going to go back to my top view. And let's see, the dimensions here, the stage is 44 foot wide. So I'm going to snap half of that, 22 foot, and 22 foot in the other direction. And it's going to be 10 foot deep. So I'm going to come back 10 foot from here. And there's my box. It's going to indicate my stage. And this has a height of three foot. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to rotate three dimension. This time I'm going to use the push pull tool and sorry, I'm going to use the right plane and I'm going to raise this up three feet. Uh, sometimes when you do that, you'll see the color changes here. Um, the color only really matters when you go to export to DDA. Uh, you want to have uniform insides and outsides of your models for uh, correct calculation. So blue here is what we want for the inside of our model. Uh, white is going to be outside of our model. And when we get into DDA, you'll see that the blue areas are going to give us some calculation. Uh, the white areas, which are going to be the outsides of the walls, are going to be transparent uh, so that we can actually see what we're doing. So I'm going to right click on this plane. I'm going to hit reverse faces. And just for continuity's sake, I'm going to do the same thing to the front. All right. I'm actually going to go and clean up my model a little bit here quickly. I'm just going to select all of these rulers and delete them all. And I'm going to rotate under here and eliminate some extra layers that might show up in my model if I don't clean them up because that, that would be outside of the room uh, and it really just becomes an obstacle to what you're viewing. So I've got my main plane, I've got my stage, so I'm going to move on to the next setting, which is my ceiling height. So I know that my lowest point here, the 30 feet, was measured in relation to the bottom of the audience plane here. So I'm going to take my line tool and I'm just going to draw up the blue axis 30 feet. I'm now going to go around the room and I'm going to match that height, hopefully nicely. There we go. Now I've got a side wall and I can continue that all around. Matching heights on the blue axis. 
you might run into a place where you uh, disguise the view of what you're trying to do, so just rotate around. There we go. There we go. And our last point. Connect back to both. All right, so I've now got an enclosed model. Uh, so this is already plenty to work with. Uh, I should say you don't need a fully enclosed model uh, to model in DDA, um, but uh, often it's nice if you're going to do any kind of uh, speech intelligence uh, measurements, uh, it's nice to have a closed model. But if you're just looking at basic coverage on audience plane, which is primarily what we're going to do today, you don't need a fully enclosed. Um, the last thing I'm going to add in here, though, is going to be this balcony that's at the rear of the room. Um, so I'm going to do this the quickest way, which is going to be outlined in the side wall and push pull it through. Uh, so if I look down here at my balcony settings, I've got uh, uh, the uh, the height of the balcony starts 10 feet up from this bottom plane from the rear of the audience. So I'm going to go 10 feet up. And it's 15 foot deep. I'm going to assume there's a six inch balcony edge in front of that. So I'm actually going to go 15.5 inches, or sorry, 15.5 feet. Uh, and I'm going to start drawing this out now. Um, like I said, it's going to have a, a six inch balcony edge. So I'm going to come back six inches. Uh, and I'm going to assume the front of this is six inches high. And then I'm going to draw this outline. I'm going to come up three foot, back to six inches, and down to this point. Uh, at this point, uh, it says I've got five rows. Each one rises one foot, uh, and each one is three foot deep. So I'm going to go back three feet, and I'm going to rise one foot, back three feet, rise one foot. Keep doing this until I get to the back wall. You could do rulers for this as well. Um, it's really however you want to go about this. There we go, that's the back wall. Now you now see that I have this outlined on the side. I'm gonna get rid of my uh, rulers, make the view a little clearer. Uh, so this is the outline of my balcony. I'm now gonna use the push-pull tool again, and I'm gonna grab this, and I'm gonna push it all the way through my model, which then eliminates it. Uh, again, this is a good way of getting rid of all those extra layers. If I just built this inside and this was ended up being an enclosed balcony, I'm going to have a whole bunch of extra layers in DDA that might get distracting. Uh, so this way, I've now got this as a cutout. Uh, I've got my balcony. I've got my main floor. And if I look inside, I can pop the roof off and I can see that I've also got all of my audience planes indicated. So this is going to be an audience plane, another one here, and each one of these becomes an audience plane. Uh, for this instance, I'm not going to worry about cross aisles or anything in the uh, uh, in the balcony. This is just for example. So that is all I needed to do. Uh, and I'm going to undo, put that roof back on. So up here, uh, this is the one bit of SketchUp you're not going to see in any of their training videos. This is going to be the plugin that we have available on our website. Uh, using these, you can export from SketchUp once you have your model. This is available for uh, and it, all the way up to SketchUp 2019 Pro. Uh, currently, I'm working in 2017, uh, but we do have the plugin available up to 19. Um, and you can export to DDA from this. If you have an existing DDA model, you can also import it back from DDA into SketchUp to do any modifications you might need to do. Uh, so if we hit this, it's going to pop up our export window. And this is where I said earlier that you need to set your inside and outside colors. Uh, by standard, uh, by default, sorry, it's going to say that outside face is white. If you had done your model the other way around, uh, you could uncheck this, and then it would assume that the inside is the white. It's, uh, it's just whichever way you want to build this. Uh, if you had imported materials in SketchUp, you can export them from here. This may cause an issue later on, so uh, I haven't actually added any materials. I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, and corner reduction uh, reduces some of the points that are used in some more complex shapes. Uh, so all this is preset. You really don't have to worry about this as long as you've done your model appropriately. Uh, you may hit some errors uh, when you try to export this. 
like you see here, materials, there are no materials, so it's saying it's a problem. It's not going to be a problem, DDA. Uh, edges, it's just saying it hasn't done anything, so that's not a problem. Um, at that point, I would continue with my export, and it's going to create a .gcf file, uh, which is what I'm going to use as my geometry in DDA. Uh, at this point, I'm going to get out of SketchUp, and I'm going to move over to DDA, and I'm going to work with the model that I had previously built. Uh, so we're going to close this, and now we're going to switch to DDA. When you initially open DDA, this is the window you're going to see. It's going to be a blank screen, uh, and you're really not going to have access to, to many menus uh, until you create a project. So we're going to go File, New Project, or you can do it just by hitting the New Project button there. And at this point, it's going to pop up a window asking you where you want to save this. Save this to my desktop. And I'm going to save it into my DDA project here. I'm just going to call this my, my DDA auditorium. And this is going to save in a .mat or MATLAB file. Once I've created this file, it's going to open the project settings window. Give a moment here. Oh, hopefully, there we go. Okay. And now we can see all of the parameters uh, for, for our project here. Uh, we're going to start at the top of the screen and work our way down. So up at the top, you, have your, your, uh, you can enter in a description of your project. Uh, not necessary, but you can put it there. The next line is, is what's key here. This is the a geometry file that you want to uh, reference to the SketchUp export that you just created. And you'll see here this is already preset to model.gcf. This is the default that when you open up a DDA project, it's going to create just a standard box for you to do some, some basic uh, prediction of primarily IntelliVox products. Um, you can drop CLF files in there and you can look at what the basic coverage pattern is, but you're not going to, obviously it's just a box, so it's not room specific. Uh, so I'm going to browse and I'm going to go to my, my same file here. And I'm going to find, oop, <laughs> give me one second, I'm going to find where it is. Uh, that's why. See what happens there? <laughs> okay, I'm going to actually go back and I'm going to export it one more time. I'm going to go okay, yes. Make sure we put it in the right place here, top level. Save this as DDA Auditorium Model. Yes. There we go. Okay, let's try this one more time. Okay, now we see it. There we go. Okay, so there is our model uh, in this line. Uh, the next plane is your listener. Uh, plane. This is where this is going to be the microphone placements in your room, which we're probably not going to get into today. That's a more advanced feature, uh, but this uh, would hold the settings and the locations of the microphones that you set within DDA. Uh, that's just a file that needs to reside in the folder with the rest of your DDA project. Moving down, we've got groups. Uh, groups are a collection of any similar uh, or same type loudspeaker. So uh, a group within itself could hold uh, really as many loudspeakers as you could want to use, um, whether that's one or 50, uh, as long as they're the same type of loudspeaker, you can do it within the same group. Um, you can do multiple groups, and, you, and that way you can have either different IntelliVox models or an IntelliVox model and a CLF file um, of varying types. Um, and the same thing would apply for CLF data. Uh, if you have a group, it has to just be like CLF uh, information, but you can have multiple groups with different CLF files within them. Uh, so the first thing, we've got group A. This is how it's going to come out of the box. Um, and from here, I can create a new, I can duplicate, I can delete uh, any of the groups that are within there. Source type is going to be the kind of loudspeaker that you're dealing with, the kind of technology, basically. So if I use this drop-down, I'm going to see 
Uh, a few of the Intellivox technologies first. ADC is going to be our analog directivity control products, which are the V90 and H90. Uh, DDC are the older beam steering products. DDS is the current line of beam shaping products. Uh, AXIS are some of the, uh, maybe some still out in the field, uh, some of the older point source products and line ray products that uh, did take advantage of the DDA, uh, uh, DDS technology uh, and, and algorithms. So that could be calculated separately from Intellivox and point source in here. Uh, point source is going to give you access to any CLF file. So we're going to start with DDS because this is going to be uh, a combination of Intellivox and CBT. CBT we're going to calculate using CLF. Intellivox we're going to ca calculate using DDS. Um, I'm going to go with the default over here, which is going to default on our mid-range product, which is the DSX380. Uh, you can navigate to, uh, to your default folder, and you can go to any other uh, files that you have uh, set up. Uh, those are some custom ones that I have. There's also a standard uh, full list of the, the, the standard models that we have. Below this, we have a, a few settings that are specific to this group. So within the group, you can set uh, how you want to calculate this. Geo means that you're calculating it based on the geography of the room. Balloon means that you're setting it based on a vertical uh, opening angle and a throw distance. Uh, we're going to stick with uh, the geography, geo method at this point. Um, restrict coverage area is going to be something that's specific to Intellivox, and that's going to cover from, uh, tell you where you want your coverage to start and where you want it to end. Uh, and then next, you're going to have how you want your calculation, your response to be calculated whether it's the group, uh, every loudspeaker combined and where they overlap in coverage, or whether you want to calculate it by individual loudspeaker coverage. We're going to leave this on group for right now. Uh, finally, your boundary. If you want to calculate rear reflections, if this is mounted flush to a wall or just off of a wall, you can calculate that. We're going to leave it on none for right now. Uh, and then the next section down here, we're going to get into the individual loudspeakers that are within this group. This is going to ha has house the exact location of the loudspeaker, uh, any physical aiming that you need to do, horizontal, vertical, uh, any delay that you want to apply to the signal that's going to that loudspeaker, uh, gain that needs to be applied in relation to the rest of the loudspeakers uh, in the model, and any EQ that you want to set as well. So, I'm going to start with just the one unit in here, and we're going to we're going to jump into the model, and we're going to see what what this gives us. So if I hit OK there, uh, you're now going to see the only change is that we've got a couple more options here. We've got this uh, this box, 3D box here, and this is our build model button. This is a button that you're going to return to quite frequently. Uh, every time you make a significant change in the model. Uh, whether that's a loudspeaker position, uh, an and aiming requirement, uh, coverage requirement, anything along those lines, this is the button that you need to use to recompile all that information uh, to be able to start mapping within the program. So it's going to take a couple seconds here. It's going to give me a warning that I don't have any audience planes set, which is okay. And there's our model. So, so far, I zoom around, this looks very similar to what I had in SketchUp. The walls are now brown instead of gray and blue, but otherwise you'll see how we do have the interiors and we're looking through the exteriors of the wall. So that's where our uh, plane orientation came into play. So at this point, I can't really do anything else because I haven't told it what areas of the room are audience planes. I haven't given it any uh, requirements in terms of what I'm expecting the loudspeakers to do. Um, and so that's going to be the next step. So I'm going to leave, for the sake of right now, obviously we're not going to place a loudspeaker in the center of a stage, although that would be ideal for a lot of applications. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're just going to leave that there for the moment, and we're going to concentrate on our audience areas. So another uh, icon has come available up here. This is the Edit Plane Properties icon. If I hit this, this is going to open another window which is going to pop up on my other screen, I believe. And I'll drag it over in just a moment. 
There we go. Okay, so this is now the window that allows me to edit all the parameters of the individual planes within the model. Um, I can click on any individual plane by uh, clicking once on the plane is going to give me the top plane. Clicking twice is going to jump through it to the next one. And I can hit spacebar to add this into my, my group of selected planes. And then they'll show up here in my window as the two planes that I have. I can name these planes if I want to. I'm not going to worry about that right now, but that will give you an, a faster way of accessing uh, these as a group later on. Um, I can set my audience plane, uh, which means this is where I'm telling DDA that I have uh, listeners sitting. So I'm going to hit this and I'm going to say that yes, these are indeed listener planes. And in the next box down, my group parameters, uh, this is where I can tell it specifically what I'm expecting out of a specific IntelliVox model. Um, so group A, it's the only one that's showing up because it's the only one I've created at this point. We know it has an IntelliVox model in it, and so I can tell it how much SPL and how important it is for me to have that SPL on a particular plane. I've cho chosen my two main audience planes here. I'm going to say I want 85 dB across these two planes, and I'm going to say it's got a weight of one. Weighting can be a somewhat confusing topic. Um, it's really just a ratio of importance from one plane to another. If I haven't set a weight on anything else, it's going to assume that it's not important or a weight of zero uh, on all the other planes. So weight of one is basically going to say this is 100% important. The other one is not important. Uh, if I start having intermixed weightings between planes, if I were to tell this that I want uh, 85 dB down here, and it's 100% important, or if I want, uh, and I want 85 dB up here in the balcony, and say that's 0.5 of importance, and that's half as important as the main floor, uh, it'll take that into account. I could go in any ratio here, I could say it's 10 times more important for the balcony uh, to get the 85 dB than the, than the main floor. And all of this is just a, a tool and a way of manipulating uh, the coverage that you get out of this and trying to fine tune your coverage uh, and, and your response out of an IntelliVox product. Um, again, this is specific to the beam shaping algorithm that you're trying to configure. So this is mainly for IntelliVox, or it's really only for IntelliVox products at this stage. Um, and any CLF that you'll have in here is going to have the coverage that's determined within the measurements that were taken for the CLF file. Uh, so you're just going to basically be viewing that coverage and you're going to be able to do mechanical adjustments to the aiming of that to make adjustments. So for right now, I'm going to say that I want my group A to cover downstairs with 85 dB, and I'm actually going to go upstairs now. I'm going to clear my plan selection. That was just a right click to open a new menu. I'm going to start selecting my balcony audience planes up here. Again, as I click on these, I'm just hitting the space bar to add them basically into, into my uh, selection stack that you see up here. Uh, and I'm going to say the same thing up here. So group A, I'm going to say I want 85 dB. So at this point, I'm saying I want to cover this entire room from this one group of loudspeakers. In a moment, I'm going to go back and I'm going to edit what this group is, and I'm going to properly place these. Uh, but this way, uh, I, I've set what the parameters of that are going to be when I start predicting my model. So I'm going to hit save, which is going to automatically update uh, the file, and I'm going to go back to, I'm actually going to build the model one more time. The only reason I'm doing this, I could have gone straight back to my settings window, but when I build the geometry for the first time, it gives me access to uh, point and clicking uh, to place my loudspeakers in the model. I'm going to show you that in a second. Uh, something else I should mention is by default, uh, if you click and drag, you're going to rotate around your model. If you hit shift and drag, you're going to move your model within the window. I'm going to move it over here on the side so I can view it while I'm doing, making changes to my settings window, which I'm going to open up again. Okay, so now I have access to the location of this loudspeaker one more time. I'm going to come back into this room. I'm going to look at the top view. And I'm going to move this where I can see it easily. 
I'm going to hit my crosshairs icon right here. This is going to be in relation to whatever I have selected. So if I have multiple units, it's going to be the one that's highlighted. I'm going to select this and I'm going to place it right along the edge of the proscenium on the wall here. So that's roughly where I want it to be. Um, I'm now going to create a new one, which is going to replicate this location. I'm going to drop it in the uh, negative coordinate on, on the y-axis, and that's going to give me a mirror image. The reason I'm able to do that, and that is the one, uh, the one time saver and shortcut that I will always say is a good thing to do, is when you're building your model in SketchUp, always work off your uh, x-axis and try to mirror your room as best as possible. If it's asymmetrical, still try to keep within uh, a center line of, of your room so that you can do easy placement uh, and easy, you know, stereo pairs of, of products like that. Um, the next setting is going to be the height of the product. This is going to be, for an Intellivox product, this is going to be the height relative uh, to the acoustic center, um, which is the center of the lowest driver of that column. Uh, for a CL update, it's usually going to be the center of the uh, of the CL file, the center of the box itself. Um, so I'm going to leave this at 2.2. Uh, I didn't mention before, but down here you can set what your audience height for the model is. 1.2 is what we typically use for a seated audience. So 2.2 for the acoustic center of the uh, of the Intellivox gives us a, a full meter um, between audience height and that. So that's a fairly good starting point. Depending on what kind of venue this is, if there's a lot of sitting standing, you might want to set uh, a different height setting. You might want to do 1.7 for standing. You might want to do 1.4 for kind of a, a midpoint between seated and standing. Uh, and then you might want to adjust the height of your, your column in relation to that. Uh, but for the sake of this, I'm going to start with uh, that basic setting. Uh, I'm going to steer these into the room a little bit. So that I'm going to do horizontal panning here. So I'm going to make a 20 degree, oh, sorry, I'm going to make a negative 20 degree rotation on this first one. Might be overshooting, but that's all right. I'm going to do 20 degree rotation on that. So again, we're mirrored. I'm actually going to back that down, do just 10 degree just to get it off the wall a little bit. It's a little more reasonable. Uh, the rest of this I'm going to leave. Uh, as a default for right now. I'm not going to put any EQ settings in at this point. I'm just looking at basic coverage. Um, I'm not going to do any vertical tilt uh, for an Intellivox model. Typically, unless there's some weird circumstance, these do want to be flush mounted to the wall, so I'm not going to do that. Roll would be an articulation around its center axis. I'm not going to do that either. Um, so at this point, I'm going to leave everything else uh, at its default, and I'm going to hit OK and you'll see the model goes away, and I'm going to have to rebuild it again. So those were some substantial enough changes. Take a second here, rebuilds, and there we go. So now if I roll around my model, I noticed something that I failed to select earlier that we're going to have to replica, uh, fix in a minute. Um, so now you can see these are placed basically where I want them. You can see my audience plane down here. And you can see that I failed to switch the balcony here to audience plane. I set the FPL I wanted on it, but I failed to tell it that it was uh, an audience plane. And that's what happens when you do these things live. So we're going to open up our plane properties one more time. And I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to select these guys again. Now, if I had named these all, all these planes balcony seating or something along those lines, I'd be able to right click and select all of the ones that have the same name, uh, but I didn't do that, so I'm gonna individually select them. And here, this drop down, I'm gonna say, yes, this is an audience plane. I'm gonna save and I'm gonna rebuild one more time. And then I'm ready to run a prediction. Okay, now all my audience planes are showing up here in gray. My loudspeakers are in the place that I want them, uh, and the audience height is set to 1.2 meters, uh, which is what I want to start with because I'm assuming everybody's going to be seated in this room. So I'm going to now hit this next button, which became available now that all of the basic parameters that I needed set are in place. So I'm going to check the response of the room. So I bring up this, it brings up my prediction window, 
Uh, and if I had multiple groups in here, I could individually select a specific group, which I'll try to get to in a minute after this. Uh, otherwise, you can, or you can select multiple groups to do simultaneously. Uh, at the moment, I just have the one group. Uh, I'm going to leave it centered around 1K, and for the sake of smearing things, I'm going to do an octave wide just so we get an indication of what this is doing. Um, I'm going to hit go. It's going to run my prediction. It'll take a little bit of time here, and I now see my coverage in the room. So what you see is that centered on 1K, I've got pretty consistent coverage front to back, and I've also got coverage up here in the balcony. So this is indicative of what IntelliBox does, um, and, and that is the, you know, the original purpose of DDA was to, be, uh, was to configure uh, IntelliBox models. Um, the next step that we're going to do is we're going to start looking a little bit closer at this. And maybe this was my initial concept for the room. And maybe what I'm realizing now is this room has a fairly high RT and I'm getting a lot of wall reflection. I'm getting a lot of illumination in the room uh, because I'm trying to cover the balcony all the way from the front here. Maybe that's not ideal for this space. Maybe it is. If this is a perfectly dead room and you're on a tight budget, you know, this is a great application where putting something at the front here and covering the entire room may work great. Another thing for a room this size that might work out great, CBT-1000 with an extension in these exact locations or possibly up a little bit higher, might give you really great coverage uh, and, and, you know, use for a multi-use space like this. Um, <clears throat> so those are some other things that you could drop in this place uh, and, and think about using and test the coverage with. So the next thing that I'm going to look at is what it would mean to drop in some delay speakers back here. So we're going to go back to my settings window. Uh, I'm actually going to, before I do that, I'm going to rebuild the model. The only reason I keep doing this a couple of extra times is because of that point and click uh, ability of, of placing the loudspeakers, which you, once you run a prediction or once you manipulate data, you lose that, that ability. So I'm going to go back into my plan view and slide this back to where I can actually work with it. And I'm going to go to my settings, and I'm going to drop in a different kind of technology. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to create a new group. I've got group B. Then I'm going to go down here to point source. And I'm now going to navigate to my default CLF folder, which is going to bring up, that's where I have all of the JBL CLF files. Uh, like I said, this doesn't have to be JBL. This is CLF uh, files are available for a lot of manufacturers. Um, so, of course, I, I am pushing for you to use JBL products whenever possible, but if you have to do a comparison, side-by-side -side comparison, or if you have existing uh, ceiling speakers or something else and you want to work those into your model and see what coverage, you know, they're providing and what you need to, to add, um, this is a great way of doing it without necessarily having to go down the route of doing a full-blown ease model uh, and really getting in the weeds with that. Um, so I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go to CBT series, and I'm going to go to something easy. I'm going to do CBT 100. Uh, I'm going to do narrow coverage. I'm going to set it for music. Uh, so you're going to you'll see. Hopefully you saw in that drop down uh, there were files for the CBT for each setting. Um, so it's particularly on the CBT-1000, which has a lot of variables in its coverage pattern. There's a unique CLF file for each one of those coverage patterns, so you can get pretty specific in your modeling. Um, so again, now that I've done that, I've got this. I'm going to go and try and place it in my room. I'm going to put it somewhere around here off the face of the balcony. Uh, I'm going to rotate this in the direction I want to aim. I'm actually going to back that off a little bit. We're going to aim this into the room, maybe, uh, let's see, 30 degrees or so. So it's pointing into the room. Um, I'm actually going to back this off a little further. Obviously, where you can actually mount these is going to vary dramatically. I'm just going to, I'm just trying to give an indication of the kinds of uh, things you can do in DDA and the places you can, you know, the, some of the things to consider. Uh, so again, I'm going to hit new, which is going to give me a duplicate of this. And in this case, since I did it in the negative uh, direction, I'm going to make that one positive. It's up there, and I'm going to steer it 
back down into the room, physically steer it, aim it. Okay, so the next thing I need to do is check its height. I've now set where I want it on the, the floor plan of the room. So I'm gonna switch over to another view. These are all your views up here that you can jump through. Uh, and I'm gonna look in, in the side. Obviously, this is not gonna cover the balcony when it's sitting down here at two meters off the floor. So let's raise this up to seven and a half meters, which is probably a little more realistic. Um, and we'll, we'll leave it. We could also put in uh, vertical tilt, but I'm gonna estimate here, you know, this could be minus two to aim it down a little bit. Um, we, can, we can try that. Uh, but given audience height here, we might be pretty close. We might need to come down a little more. Again, this is just for example. So now that I've done that, I'm going to hit OK, and I'm going to build my model one more time. Now, a couple of things are going to pop up uh, when you start using CLF data, um, which you may not know until you try to run a prediction. Uh, the CLF file itself is going to have what the gain uh, allowances are uh, for that particular unit. Uh, we talked a little bit about this um, last week in Stephen Lewis's class. Um, if you go into CLF editor, uh, you can or CLF viewer, um, you can see what those parameters are, and you can you can manipulate based on that. Uh, if you don't want to do that extra step, you can drop your CLF file into your room. You can run a prediction. This time I'm gonna use group B, because group B are my CBT 100s here. I'm gonna do the same thing right around 1K, do an octave. I'm gonna check out my coverage. And here we go. Now the thing that we need to look at is inherently without changing my gain settings, uh, coverage looks pretty good. My SPL scale has automatically adjusted to center around uh, the, the gain settings of this product. Uh, as it did previously, it tried to center around the SPL that I, that I uh, requested in the room by, in my SPL and weight settings. So previously that was set to 85 dB, so my scale has now shifted. Um, so two things. Uh, one, I know right away that this has given me sub 75 dB uh, based on the settings that I have in here. So I know right away that there's going to be upwards of a, a 10 dB difference between my delays and my mains. Another thing I can look at is down here in the lower left, it's gonna, you're gonna have a few more bits of information depending on the view uh, that you're looking at. Um, so right here, it's telling me total headroom on this product is almost 30 dB. Uh, that's gonna be relative to that CLF file that you would be able to read if you went into CLF viewer. Um, so I'm gonna now go back into my settings and I'm gonna make a gain change. When I make a gain change, this is one of the wonderful small tweaks that don't affect uh, or don't require me to rebuild the model. So I can set my gain at, at 10 and I can rerun this prediction. And you're now gonna see that my response has not changed. <laughs> so let me double check that. Because <laughs> I changed on the wrong unit. Sorry about that. There we go. So if I go to group B and this time, if I set it to 10 dB, I can now go back and hopefully I get a different result here. Let's try that one more time. There we go. So now my response has shifted up 10 dB and my headroom down here in the left has dropped 10 dB. So now I know this is in the ballpark for where I need it to work along with IntelliVox. Uh, right off the bat, uh, I can see that, yes, there's a lot of energy here in the back of the room, but I'm also saving the uh, amount of energy that was being dispersed within the room shooting from the front of the room. So this could be uh, a good direction to go in. Um, if I run this with both of these right now, it's gonna base the coverage on the previous audience plane settings that I put in place, which was for group A, my IntelliVox, to still cover the entirety of the room. So 
So I'm actually not going to do that just yet, because right now if I do that, it's going to give me overlapping coverage up here in the balcony, which is not going to be a true indication of what I'm trying to achieve here. So I'm going to go back in to my audience planes, to my plane properties, and I'm going to once again select my balcony. And as you saw, as I keep clicking, one click for each layer that I'm trying to pass through. Uh, so that's why I have to click four times to get through this, uh, this front plane, because I'm going through the ceiling, I'm going through the face of the balcony, through the back of the balcony, and then I ultimately get down to that floor plane. I could have also articulated around and gone straight to it, um, but that's just why I'm clicking those multiple times. Uh, so I am now going to say, I'll leave it as audience playing because I still want the relation uh, of my coverage at 1.2 meters off of the floor. But I'm going to now tell it that group A, which is my Intel box, requires no SPL and it's not important to me. I'm going to save this. I have just enough time to build this one more time. And now I'm going to do my prediction using both of these by shift clicking and selecting both of them. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and hit go. And there we go. There's my fairly consistent coverage in the room. Uh, my energy is focused a little bit more on each audience area, so I should get a little bit uh, better intelligibility, a uh, little better, a uh, little less excitement of the room's acoustics. Um, and, and I now know that the basic design that I wanted to implement is going to work in this space. Um, obviously, from this point, I can go to measure any frequency that I want, uh, and there are actually a, a a lot more tools that are available in DDA um, that I'm not going to get into just now, but I will mention them. Um, there are a whole lot of views over on the left here that you can go through to look at the individual directivity of a single loudspeaker. You can look at polar data. You can look at total SPL in the room, director of reverb ratio in the room, which might be a decent one to look at. Um, some of the, uh, the STI, which I don't want to get into because you have to set up materials or set the uh, acoustic parameters of the room in order for that to function, which we haven't gotten into. Um, so this is just for basic coverage. Um, the other side of DDA is going to be after you've uh, completed your basic design, you're happy with it, you can do what's called a full run. And that's basically primarily tweaking uh, and adjusting the algorithm for the Intellivox units and setting, uh, setting their DSP settings so that you can go deeper into what the coverage is. Once I've done that, which takes a few minutes to compile depending on uh, how complex your model is and how many uh, loudspeakers you have in it, uh, you're able to then place microphones and get uh, actually a, a frequency response uh, along, you know, at your microphone, your listener positions within the room. Uh, so there are more features that you can dig into uh, once you're happy with your room. Uh, at this point, uh, I, we might dig a little further into that in next week's uh, DDA class, which is going to be a bit more of a dive into a, a more complex project uh, with Jeff Phillips, which is, uh, which he uses this frequently for creating designs and verifying designs. Um, so we'll dig into that more next week. Uh, so this was a basic start to finish uh, coverage uh, estimation and, and design tool application for, for DDA. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to hand back to Laura, because I think we came in right at 50 minutes here, which is great, uh, and open it up to questions. Okay, we do have one that just came in. Um, they're asking, could you please do a quick overview on how to build an array with individual speakers like JBL VRX? Okay, so DDA works primarily with CLF files. Um, 
VRX has a CLF file available for an individual unit, in which case you can drop it in place. Um, there is no shortcut for uh, dropping uh, multiple CLF files into an array because the behavior of the array changes from a single unit to multiple units. So it, it has to be measured specific to the array configuration, which is the reason why we don't have complex arrays, mechanical arrays in DDA at the moment. Um, so for using VRX or using uh, VTX uh, or any of those products, you do need to use the line array calculators. All right, next question is asking, can you please explain how to locate the speaker? How to locate the speaker, uh, as in place it in the room? Um, if you go to, so I'm gonna go back to my settings window. So if I go back to my <clears throat> parameters here, to pop up in a second. So any of the loudspeakers that are in your groups, are going to be down here. Anything that is highlighted, you're able to place. Uh, actually, previously when I did this, you saw that this box was available. Uh, and this is why I said you have to rebuild the model uh, to get this functionality. Um, I could go in here and I could just type in coordinates and I could drop my loudspeaker in place doing that. Um, but let me go back and let me rebuild real quick so I can just drop and place it. So if I build it, And I do understand that this was an extremely fast run through of what DDA is capable of. Um, so I, I apologize for the things that I ran over very quickly, um, but this, you know, in a short amount of time, I wanted to give you as, as much a grasp of what it's, what DDA is capable of as possible. Um, so anyway, I rebuilt my model. My prediction went away. I'm still in the top view. Uh, and if I go back to my settings window, And now I'm looking at, as I have uh, a loudspeaker highlighted, you'll see it turns green in my model. And if I hit the crosshairs, I'm now able to select this and put it wherever I want. So I can move it into the room there. And then from that point, I can manip yeah, manipulate the height or the aiming or anything else. Um, I can also go back and I can just type back in the coordinates that it was at. Uh, I know it was mirrored to the other side. So I can just do that and pop, pop it back in place. So either one of those. Um, and as long as you have just built the model, you will see it physically moving as you drop it in, uh, drop in the coordinates. I hope that's what the question was. If not, I apologize and please chat the question again. All right, and this question is asking, does the SketchUp plugin work only in the pro version? Uh, no, so what I was using was, uh, was SketchUp 2017 Make, which is actually still available and it's a free version of SketchUp. Um, so if you want to use that one, uh, by all means, you can you can use it. You don't have to buy SketchUp. All right. Then the next question is asking, um, in a church project, the listener is standing and sitting. Do we manage, in this case, the height of the listener? Yes. So there's a couple ways you can look at that. Um, usually, when I'm looking at that, I set a, a mid seating height, so uh, I might set it to 1.4 meters. Um, really where it comes into play is the back of your room, um, and I'll show you what I mean uh, if I set out of this. So, so this particular project is still set for 1.2 or seated audience height. I'm just going to predict the, uh, the IntelliBox. So I'm going to hit go, and I'm going to switch to another view in a second. Okay, so I'm going to switch to, this is my basic coverage. I'm going to switch to the side view. Uh, and now what we're looking at here, this sideline is showing me my seated audience height. Obviously, if this is a standing audience height, then somebody at the back of the room is standing up here at, at you know, 1.7 meters, whatever, whatever it happens to be, six foot, five, 10, whatever you want it to be. Um, so the danger is that if they're standing in the back of the room, they may stand directly out of the beam, especially at higher frequencies. Um, so you might want to set this to uh, the overall audience plane to standing height 1.7 for the entire room. 
in which case it's going to aim the entirety of the beam up a little bit higher. The only danger you get there is in the front of the room, you might be uh, overshooting somebody seated in the front of the room. So it does have to be a little bit of a compromise, and there are different ways where you can manipulate that. You could set a physical different height in the back of the room uh, in your model so that, you know, maybe this is two feet higher, and that way when you do seated height relative to all these planes, you know, then it accommodates the person that's standing in the back of the room, and the person that's standing in the middle of the room is already within the beam. Um, the other thing that you do have to keep in mind is in a lot of these rooms, the rear wall may be causing severe reflections, which may lead you to need a slightly higher mounting height. It may lead you to leave it where it is mounting height-wise and try to avoid the back wall, which is another thing you can do by setting uh, a weighting. Uh, say, say if I ask for the back wall to have, even though it's not an audience plane, I can set an SPL requirement of zero, and I can give it a weighting of one, at which point I'm telling DDA that it's as important for the back wall to not get any energy as it is for the main listening plane to get 85 dB of energy, um, or whatever you set it to. So there's a few different ways where you can manipulate the coverage within DDA. Um, so it's really up to you and how important it is that a standing person in the back of the room gets equal energy to a sitting person in the front of the room and how much uh, rear wall reflection you're, you know, you're comfortable with. All right, next question. Are there any symmetry options for making speaker pairs? And if not, are there plans to add that? Uh, well, I mean, there, there is in the way that I just done it. I mean, you can individually locate them, but if you do a group of two loudspeakers and orient them around a center line, you're in essence doing that, and you're calculating them as a pair uh, by doing the uh, prediction calculation as a group. Um, so in, in essence, I'm already doing what you're talking about. Um, you can, you know, if I were to set this back to individual loudspeaker, I'm going to get a different response. Um, this is now going to calculate each individual loudspeaker in the room, and what you're going to see is you're going to see in the front where only one is covering, you're going to see uh, coverage of individual in back of the room where they're summing, you're going to see overpower. Um, so so uh, calculating these as a group is accounting for the summation of the pair, uh, and then just doing the symmetrical placement in the room is also uh, giving me that functionality. Okay, the next question is asking, is DDA free of cost? Yes, DDA is completely free and it's license free. Um, the current version is DDA version 5.1. It's available for download on the JBL site. All right, and then we have another um, software link question. They're asking if you can share the SketchUp software link. I think it might've been on your first slide. Uh, this is actually the, yeah, uh, sorry. Let me get back. This is actually the download link for DDA, not for SketchUp. Uh, for I, 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 SketchUp's another manufacturer. I don't want to get too deep into, you know, it's, it's a great tool for doing this. And um, we offer the plugin so that people that are comfortable with SketchUp can get to this. Uh, but if you, go, if you go to the SketchUp site and you look for uh, either current downloads for the 2019 or 2020 version, or if you look for, um, uh, I think it says past, you know, past versions or something like that, uh, you'll you'll be able to find all the ones that are currently available from them. Okay, perfect. And then the last question is asking if they can get a link to the session's recording. Um, yes, all of the sessions that we do are recorded, and it usually takes us a few days to get them sent out. You'll receive it via email, and we also put it out onto our YouTube channel, um, which if you go into YouTube and look, it's under Harmon Professional University. We have a full playlist there. So that's it for questions, and I think we're at time. Um, Keith, thank you so much for the presentation today, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you are wanting to look into any upcoming sessions, the whole calendar is on pro.harman.com. So everybody have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.